Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. I am your host, Bill Brewster. This episode is brought to you by me. Troy Lavinia is the founder of Stream by Mosaic, my second sponsor. I am probably going to do these interviews with all sponsors because I like for people to get to know the people behind the businesses that are supporting me. I really enjoyed talking to Troy. I think that the episode will bring out his personality a little bit. I think Troy is just a great guy. I got a ton of respect for what he's built with Stream. I like how he thinks in systems. And he's got some interesting comments about hiring hockey players and what he's learned. So I really hope that the fans of the program enjoy this one. And thank you, Troy, for coming on. And thank you for sponsoring me. And everybody should sign up to Stream by Mosaic. You can find them at streamrg.com. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G.com. They are integral to my investment process. I realize that the subscription is not inexpensive. Price is not value. Check it out. It's great stuff. Hope you enjoy the episode. Happy Monday. So, Troy, how are you doing today? Doing great, Bill. Thanks for having me. How are you? I am fantastic. Thank you for sponsoring the show, man. This is exciting for me. Oh, well, it's great. Great for us, too. It's the first time we've done this and and you've been a longtime friend and and client. And so really appreciate all of the support from the very start and good we could formalize this. When I was talking to Tad, I was I was raving a little bit. For those that don't know, Tad is uh, the president. And, and I've been uh, dealing with him. And I said, man, the, the platform has gotten so much better since I first got on it. And he goes, like, are you just buttering me up for a sponsorship? And I said, no, man, I, I honestly <laughs> believe this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have some crappy product as a sponsor. And it wasn't crappy a year ago, but it's gotten, I mean, the amount of work that you guys have put into the platform over the past year has been very noticeable. So kudos. Wow, well- that's great to hear. Yeah, he had mentioned that you said that, and it's it's so good to hear. We're, we've got our heads down, and we talk to clients to understand their perspectives, but to hear, and, and I think if anything, we we um, we err on the side of thinking we're not as good as we are, so it keeps us going, And so it's, but it's always really nice to hear that type of feedback, so thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I also feel like I'm not as good as I am, although maybe I'm no good. So then I'd be accurate, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not what we've heard. Well, I appreciate it. So how'd you start stream? Like what, what, it, how did this yeah. come to fruition? So I, I started in the expert network industry 16 years ago at a place called Vista research. And Vista is now part of GuidePoint global, which is one of the initial uh, original expert networks. And then I went to Elliott Management, a oh. hedge fund, doing research like that and like this internally. So partnering with all of our PMs and analysts to make sure we had really good on the ground intelligence. And I, and I love doing that. I'm kind of a, frankly, I don't know much about the investing process, but I'm really good at finding sources and getting them to talk to us. And I, I love building systems and I love building teams. And so that's what I was doing there for a little while. And then wanted to do some something entrepreneurial. And so I started an expert network called Mosaic Research Management back in 2010. So 11 years ago. And Mosaic just sets up one-on-one expert calls for our clients. And our clients are all hedge funds and public equity investors. So we have about 150 clients in that business. If those hedge funds want to talk to industry experts, they'll come to us. We run a lot of custom searches to find good kind of very precise experts, given the research requests of the clients. And it's a service business. So client requests an expert, we find an expert, make the introduction, client pays us, we pay the expert, and that's it. There's no residual product. And, And what I found out through painful trial and error that scaling a service business like that is really not fun. And so about five years ago, we decided, all right, we can there's two paths here. We can either try to grow this business 50 to hundred percent a year, raise outside money, hate life, or we can 
slow it down, grow it 10 to 15% a year, make money, you know, do a great job for our client base, create a great environment for our employees, but just have a slower growth type cash flow business as opposed to a fast growth business. And I think that's the right path. And so that's what we decided to do. And it makes a lot of sense in a service business, I think, for a lot of reasons. So that's kind of what we've been doing at Mosaic is just growing the service business slowly. The other thing that it allows us to do is to incubate products like Stream. So we have these 150 expert network clients. And about two years ago, we started hearing about ThirdBridge doing expert call transcripts. And then, you know, a little after that, we heard about Tegas doing expert call transcripts. And there's these companies that are doing this, a few of them that are doing it well. And I thought, well, we already have all the raw materials here, but we're recruiting 250 experts every week. We've got 150 clients. Like if we can figure out a way to put this together in a, in a high quality way, we can probably come up with a transcript product of our own. And so we, we set about doing that and, um, and built Stream within Mosaic as a subsidiary and grew the business until, so for about a year, grew the business. And then in April of this year, we were getting good traction. So we spun it out. And our thinking in doing that was that operationally, we created it very separate. So there's no overlapping employees. Stream was completely self-sufficient. And so we spun it out of Mosaic. And and the thinking was, there's probably going to be the right way to grow Stream as a content SaaS business is much different than the way we want to grow Mosaic. And just to frame this so people understand, Stream is is the library of expert interviews that I can sign on and I can have access if I'm interested in Coinbase or Charter or any company, I can pull up. I mean, as of now, what you've got like the two and a half years, it seems like I'm, I'm you just cited it. So I apologize yeah. for not remembering exactly the year, but you've got like yeah. two years of expert transcripts on that company and the competitors. Yeah, that's right. So Stream is the transcript library. So we, we basically took a similar model to what we were doing in Mosaic. And we decided to record and transcribe the calls. And so all of the calls in stream are a buy side analyst interviewing an industry expert about a particular public equity. And it's a former executive, a customer or a competitor most, most of the time. And the analyst is asking things that are relevant to the analyst community at that point. And most of the calls are 30 to 60 minutes. We record them, we transcribe them, and then we put them in the library. So you can either listen to them in there like you would a podcast or you can read them yeah and and we've done about eight thousand calls over the past year and a half and we're we're ramping that library pretty quickly and so we decided to spin that out as a separate business in april and the thinking there was we want to keep growing mosaic slow it's probably worth more to us as the owners than it is to an outside investor so we're not going to take in outside money in that business and there's not much of an exit strategy there Whereas the right way to grow a company like Stream, which is a SaaS business, it's very scalable. We want to put money into that business and we want to grow it because we feel like we're in a really good position vis-a-vis the one or two competitors that we have out there. And if we are able to grow it, we're able to increase the library size and the subscriber base, we can create a nice little moat around that business. Yeah. And so that's what we did. And and then um, we, uh, we sold the business to AlphaSense about two months ago. And so we founded the company back in the beginning of 2020. And then you know, 15, 16 months later, spun it out from Mosaic. And then three or four months after that, sold it to AlphaSense. And now we're going to take it and, and it's going to be kind of the internal content generation machine within AlphaSense, which is an AI-based data management platform, so similar to a Bloomberg or a CapIQ or a FactSet that investors and corporates use to, to gather information to, to research companies. That's got to be pretty rewarding, man. Yeah, Bill, it is. Um, so this is one of the things that we had kind of hoped for when we started Stream. So we started it within Mosaic 16 months ago. And one of the things I've learned about myself is that I'm, I'm decent at the first 18 to 24 months of a company, and it's what I really love doing. So take a shoestring budget, 
pull together a few good people and an idea, create something valuable. Um, what I'm, yeah, I'm not particularly great at then years two through 10 and taking that and growing it, or I don't have that experience. And, and, um, and so the plan with stream was always, let's create something really valuable. And then let's raise venture capital. Once we get to a certain critical mass and we can put in place a really great experience management team who can take it to the next level. Or if we were lucky enough to have a liquidity event, then we could, you know, sell to a strategic or to a private equity who could, who could do something similar. And so that's luckily what we were able to do with AlphaSense. And so the, the plan is kind of what we planned from the start, which is amazing. That's cool. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be staying on for the next, I'd say two years at least, just because what I found is that we get along really well with the team there. It's been a really good fit from a cultural standpoint. And I'm just really excited to have the additional resources to help to help build the business over the next couple of years. Well, what'll be nice, I think, as a, as a consumer is I've noticed, I mean, you're reaching out to me, always asking, you know, do you want to do some calls? And uh, I, I think having a, a broader set of people reaching out to more and more people to get more and more calls in the library and transcripts in the library, it's going it, to, it seems like a no brainer win-win to me. And one of the things that I, you know, when I was kind of talking to you because I'm on FinTwit, you know, Tegas is sort of the platform that everybody had known about first because I think that they came out a little bit uh, with the marketing a little bit quicker, I guess. But um, what I've noticed about your transcript library is the breadth is, is uh, for lack of a better term, super wide. They're like very complementary products, I would say. Like it's not one or the other is needed. Yeah, that's what that's the way we've thought about it from the beginning, which and and what we've really seen be the case for clients. Jessica so planted think, this seed in my head, so she should be yeah. rewarded for good sales. But once she said it, I was like, oh, I get this. Yeah, we talked about it a lot, and I think that. I mean. One of the things it goes back to is just the abundance mindset versus the scarcity mindset, right? This is a new category that we're all creating. And Third Bridge was there first, and then Tegas was right there, and, and now Stream is there. And I think we're the three that are doing this really, really well in slightly different ways. And the, there's a big enough pie to go around, first of all. And then from the client standpoint, these products sit really nicely together and you might not need three, but you can definitely use two of these really, really well side by side. So, you know, I'd imagine, I always think about this like uh, consumer streaming services. So if you think about Netflix, huh. Amazon prime, Hulu, et cetera, I know at least in my house, we have subscriptions to, I don't know how many of them, maybe seven or eight. If only a bundle existed, you might not need to have that many subs. <laughs> yeah, that could be. <laughs> But we used we use two, yeah, right, and, and like we use Netflix, we use Amazon Prime, and I think that the reason we do that is just because that's the mind space that you have for this type of content, and I still, I think it's similar in the the B two B space. So I think most of the corporates and the investors have room for two of these services in their mind and in their workflow. Oh, for sure, and that's sure. what we're seeing. Yeah, yeah. and um, and so. They, they complement each other really nicely. I'd say about more than half of our clients are using either Third Bridge or, or Tegas or another type of transcript service in addition to stream. It's, um, I mean, look, if, if like you're a retail person, I think you got to have some amount of money to justify it. But after, after having access to these networks and the library, it's really, really hard for me to imagine doing fundamental research without it. There's a lot of really good insights. Yeah, that's the feedback that we get from everyone. And it's nice. Now, you know, these are expert calls that are typically only available to the largest fund managers. And now more people have access to them. It's kind of dem democratizing yeah. it to a bit, right? It's on trend. Yeah. Getting information out into the world is a good thing, I think. I'm not sure that everybody's going to love it, right? Because uh, some people used to try to generate alpha with it, but I think it's a good thing to do. And I, you're not going to keep it. 
I don't think we're living in an, in a world where information is going to be able to kept, be kept too private anyway on a go forward basis. So why not lead with a product? Yeah, I, I think that that's kind of the, the way things are headed, right? Yeah. And so you can go, you can go with that force or you can go against it. And so it made a lot of sense for us to try to create a product that, that captured that momentum. What, what got the uh, entrepreneur bug in you? Like, I mean, I would think Elliot's a, you're, you're consulting or hired by them. That's a pretty good gig. And then you go and you say like, damn the torpedoes, I'm starting a business. Yeah. I, from what I've seen, so like from what I've come to realize is I, I think most people are entre- entrepreneurs at heart or not. Yeah. Right? There's, you know, I think there's generally three categories of, of people specifically so you have entrepreneurs and then you have like employees or contributors and then you also have artists and i think most people would primarily fall into one of those categories from what i've seen the people that i've worked with and that i'm friends with and that i've hired over the years and people who are entrepreneurs at heart who are living as an employee it's it's a round peg in a square hole no matter how good the work is and so yeah, I, I loved what I was doing at Elliot, but there was kind of an itch there. And I knew that I needed to be doing something for myself. And I had seen a couple of my friends go out and do their own thing. And so I was complain, <laughs> complaining to my wife often enough that she said, hey, this <laughs> this has got to stop. Either you you start the business or or you're going to regret this for the rest of your life. So now's the time to do it. And we, we didn't have kids yet. And, and so she gave me the leeway to, to step out and do the business. And then did that, got it pretty stable. And then I've actually given her the, the, the green light to do that as well about six years ago. Oh, so cool. my wife and I both, yeah. So we both have businesses and, and it's worked out really nicely for both of us. Do you have kids? We do. We have a nine-year-old son and a four-year-old daughter. You guys both have businesses and two children. Congrats. I have mad Thanks. respect for that family. Oh, it's a good, it's a good one. You you work hard, but you can also have a lot of flexibility and and plan that plan the kids into to your day. And so I think it's created a good lifestyle for them too. Yeah. Uh I don't I need to be careful how I frame this because lucky is not the right <laughs> word that I want to use, but like very fortunate, I think, to have COVID occur when it occurred because everything could be done over zoom right and all of a sudden uh your business sits in the center of uh, i i don't know a lot of work trends that i think make sense and are going to be there in the future right i mean i guess you could probably do it over the telephone anyway but i think that uh just thinking about the capital light nature of what you do it couldn't have been hurt by COVID, if that makes sense yeah i think it's been a generally positive trend you know fortunately for this business, I would say. Yeah. We started, we started stream maybe a month before COVID hit. Right. And I, I probably haven't met 95% of my colleagues in person yet. Yeah. That's wild. Huh? (laughs) It's crazy. Yeah. But you see them all the time and this is, you know, zoom creates such a good experience that you feel like if you have the right meeting rhythms in place, and the right structures in place, you can work really, really effectively. So I interviewed that's been good. Uh, a woman from uh, Margot Edelman, and she does this uh, this trust index. And people are the their trust in tech is declining, and I find it shocking because imagine COVID without tech. Yeah, seriously, like it would yeah, have been think, impossible. Yeah, think about the reality versus the perception or what the media kind of portrays, right? Though. So I think about my, my, I, I'm not a big consumer of news and information, frankly, just because I feel like it can be a distraction from what I'm doing right ahead of me. But there's a lot of information out there that would lead you to believe that technology is invasive and that, you know, it's you know, your information is out there and it's, that's a scary thing. Yeah. But the day-to-day reality isn't really, isn't 
isn't quite so scary. It's actually quite good, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like, I look, would, look at what we're doing. Look at what you're doing. Yeah, I'd and even argue really that some of my thing. information being out there has helped me in many ways, which is odd. I think I'm a I'm generally a big believer in like the open book theory of life, or, or and definitely of business. And I learned this when I first started my company. Whenever I'd have a business idea, you we send somebody an NDA. I'm going to share something really sensitive with you. And, and we don't do that anymore. Yeah. And I, what I found is that, yeah, there's always more to be gained by sharing freely mm-hmm. than there is uh, lost in my experience. And just, I, I, there's, there hasn't been a single case where I've been burned by sharing ideas, huh. information and information more, more freely rather than keeping it close to the vest. What do you think um, about you or your skill set or your enjoyment like why do you think you're good at the uh, well i shouldn't say good at because i think you're probably good at at a lot of stages but why do you think you gravitate towards towards the shoestring startup uh nature of of businesses i think i like it i think i think i'm pretty good at it because i'm a b plus or higher at many different aspects of business huh Interesting. Yeah. And that's kind of what you need when you're getting started. You need people who, you need just a handful of people who really care about each other, who are really passionate. So, you know, I think I'm pretty empathetic, pretty passionate, and um, have a good motor. So, those are all things that you need for those first 12 months to 18 months of a company. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm generally decent at a bunch of different things. So, if we need to write sales emails or sell a product, I can do that. If we need to engineer, the workflow and the systems to create the product that can do that reasonably well. And I enjoy all of those things. And I, I love hiring. That's example, what I was I thinking. Love, you got to be really yeah. good at thinking about like, what players do we need now? And how do I find the right ones? Yeah, absolutely. I love creating you know, hundreds of fake org charts <laughs> drawn up. <laughs> and uh, Is that your doodle? Think, you just always, do org charts? Oh, I love Oh, I love it. And I think about oh, who's who's the ideal person, you know, and, and you're always uh, at least me. I'm always kind of thinking about what is, you know, what does this org chart need to look like in a few months? And who are these ideal people? Oh, I talked to Bill. Bill could be a really great person for this particular particular role. So I really like that. So I, I, that's what I like, I think, is that this first year, that first year or so of a business, you really have to be doing a bit of everything and you got to be in the trenches with with people. So it creates a great camaraderie and there's a lot of, a lot of just like joy that can be created in doing that. Yeah. And then also a decent amount of value too. So you're pretty well rewarded for it if you can do it well and create something valuable. Yeah, man, I would think so. And, and uh, like, how do you, are you somebody, I, I'm asking these questions because I think that startup phase is really difficult and figuring out like, what can I outsource versus what do I need to keep in in house because the budget is tight at the time? Like, are you somebody that's naturally gravitated towards team building and motivation from like an inherent type thing, or is it something that you just kind of learned over time? Oh boy, that's a, that's a great question. I I think that. The team, so the teams are are like a system, and so I think a lot about what's the work that needs to be done in order for this system to operate properly, and then who are the people that can do it. And so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's how I think about how I think about team building, making sure that everybody fits within the system really nicely, and that. Everyone has a role that contributes to the greater good of the system. And, and, um, and then I think we're always looking to, to enable everyone to be doing the work that they like to do the most hmm. and that they're best at. And that's kind of the, the work that couldn't be done by a less expensive resource potentially, right? And so we've done a lot of outsourcing and we've done a lot of Dele- we, we do a ton of delegation. So I always think that you know, if you're working in our business and you're doing something that you don't really enjoy doing or that you're not really good at or that could be done 
80% as well by somebody who is you know, in the Philippines or India or one of the lower cost areas of, of, of hiring, then we should, yeah, we should make a change in order to, in order to facilitate that because I want people to be doing the things that they're best at, that they enjoy the most that can't be done less expensively. When did you learn that skill? And I ask the question that I ask because uh, I'm at times a bit of a control freak and it totally impedes my ability to move forward. Delegating would, would go a long way in my <laughs> life at times. I think that I st I'm not sure exactly when I learned it, but it was pretty early on. Like I'm the kind of person who was thinking, you know, when it was me and my, co my first colleague, Pete, in Mosaic 11 years ago, I'm the kind of person who is writing up the procedures for what we were doing while it was just the two of us. Yeah. And um, there's some amazing tools out there now, though, Bill, where you can, if you, if you can do something, you can record yourself doing it. You can find a virtual admin. Most of what you do can fall within two or three tranches of work. And this work that you're doing here needs to be done by you, right? Yeah. This, like you're the talent, but you don't know. I don't know how much of the rest of what you do within your whole business system, how much of it's done by you. And, you know, if there are things within that business system that are done by you, that could be done by somebody else. Well, Troy, let I me ask you a question. Yeah. How seamless was your scheduling experience? You can be honest here. I thought it, I mean, I think it was other than the fact that it was my admin. It was my admin. I could ask. I could ask her. Well, I think that. Uh, but I know. I think it was pretty good. I think you might find that uh, the have? the link came in a little late, and you know, there's just like stuff that look when it was like a fly by the night little podcast, and I was doing this uh, stuff on on the side. Like I didn't have to worry about do I need an admin or, you know, like as the conversations get more serious. I, I don't know that I need a research analyst, but the idea has kind of like popped through my mind where it's like, look, I can't do the research that I need on the guests and also research companies in the way that I want to research them. Like I, I, there's just not enough of me to get it done. So I yeah. need to go through sort of a J curve in my own life where I'm spending more money, but opening up time. And it's, uh, I haven't had to face this in a while. It's a nice problem to have, but it's something that's requiring letting go a little bit, you know, and, and I think that that's a learned skill. Yeah, I, I think it's absolutely a learned skill. And I think if, if you can put your attention on the, 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 um, the good feeling that comes with when you're able to hand that off successfully and you can see somebody just running with something for you, I mean, that, that's such a good feeling, right? And to the extent that that feeling can override the concern and the fear that, that like, I, I mean, anybody who starts anything, like you have a pride, you're a craftsman, just like I was with recruiting experts. And, and so, yeah, to the extent that you can enjoy the process of handing it off, you can enjoy creating a good job for somebody that they enjoy doing and and then have that off your plate. Like that's a, that's a good feeling. Yeah. So I always say, you just got to stay committed to that delegation. What are you doing? What does the system look like right now? What kind of people do you have working with you? Uh, if you envision a chicken with its head cut off and then you put that head, <laughs> my head on that chicken, that's the system. No. Uh, I mean, you know, I got a producer and, and he's fantastic and he's got a great team, but when it comes to uh, review and whatnot, I, I'm looking into hiring somebody that'll help me do some of the, like the easier edits I think can be done by somebody else. And then if they have some questions on some of the content, cause I, re this is a really light touch show. I don't edit that much, but I usually want to listen at least once to make sure that nobody's saying anything sensitive. So if I could train sure. people to hear like, this is what sensitive information actually sounds like. And, you know, sometimes in recording, somebody will say like, uh, that's not going to fly with compliance or something. If I could trust somebody to say like, you know, obviously like Matthew knows to cut that what he doesn't know or well, he, he knows, but he doesn't want to take his own editorial ear and, and 
put the content back together, if I could outsource that stuff, it would free up a lot of time because the amount of editing and like doing the show notes, stuff like that, that stuff takes a lot of time that is not really value added to my or my guest life. If you want to connect offline, I, I love this stuff. Okay, so, good. I, yeah. I, I, I'm sure you already have my org chart drawn up. <laughs> no, we, you know, so for example, like for, for us, there's certain types of work that, that needs to be done by strategic thinkers, right? And then there's certain types of work that's client facing that you want to be done by certain folks that are, you know, maybe onshore who are able to react in real time and hop on Zoom and then we have recruiting of experts, which is something that we're doing every day. We're recruiting hundreds of experts every day at this point within stream, but you know, that can be done by certain types of folks that are, that are different than people who are client facing. And then we have administrative tasks that can be done by, you know, VAs in the Philippines. And so those are some of the, the roles that we're scaling on a, on a, um, on a pretty crazy basis at this point. So we've got, say, maybe a third of our workforce is, is uh, in the Philippines right now. Huh. And they're, and they're great. <laughs> they're, they're absolutely fantastic at anything uh, with regard to like booking. You know, if you're, you're scheduling, booking, prepping a guest for an interview, those types of things. Yeah, that would they can be do helpful. It. They can do, yeah, they can do those things just as well as anybody around here. And then there's, people there with technical proficiency and everything. So editing and compliance review and, and all types of stuff. Well, you know, it's, um, it's just making sure that that for for example, scheduling, prepping, saying this is, this is the, what you should need or expect to have for the podcast, you know, stuff like that. That's just like, should be a packet that's sent out to every guest. That would be nice to have somebody else do. Yeah, you know, and that would that yeah. would like free me up to do the research that I need to to give a good interview. Because the one thing that I have found is uh, I don't want to get on the mic without knowing what somebody does, right? Because you got you got to be able to talk through something like the, just the lights go on, whatever you got to go. Yeah, that requires a lot of prep. So, do you think there is there a dossier that someone could create for you, or do you need to get online and kind of really? roll up your sleeves and dig in for an hour or two? Um, I don't know. I, you know, I kind of like the, um, I, I, I don't want to have like a gotcha conversation, but I kind of like that you don't know what we're about to talk about when it goes on. Right. And like you and I are just talking about how you think in systems and how you build teams. I don't know that we would get to this conversation if I had a dossier that was sent. Now, maybe that's like stupid of me to say, it, it could make sense if if I just said, send me your background, send me some interesting stuff about you. Oh, I wonder though, if I wonder if there's a, what I meant was a dossier that a, you know, an admin could create for you about me. A- anyway. Yeah, probably. I don't know. We should, we should connect offline because I like where your head's <laughs> going. So how are you, how are you dealing with labor right now? I mean, if you're scaling up and you need help, it's not exactly the easiest market to hire people, is it? I mean, it doesn't sound no, like I, it. No, that's what I've heard too. It, it's supposed to be a tough one. You know, I think the key is, well, one of the fun things is, is you have to find deep labor pools for your key roles, right? If there are any, you know, we have roles where we need to hire 100 people over the next 12 to 18 months for, you know, there's two or three particular roles within this company. That's a lot of people, man. It's a ton of people. And so if we were trying to do like a, a one-off hunt and peck for those types of people, that would be, you know, that's, that's a real bottleneck and that won't work. And then there's other roles where we need maybe five people over the next 12 to 18 months, which you know, we can take a lot more time and be a lot more esoteric in the types of people we're finding there. And so I think that's one of the most important things at first, at least when we're scaling this, is looking at, you know, is this like a mass role or is this a kind of niche craftsman type role within the, within the business? And if it's a mass necessity type role, then we need to have, you need to have a really, really big, deep, responsive labor pool. 
behind that. Otherwise, you're just painting yourself into a corner, I think. And so I think we're really lucky in that in that sense. But then also you have to think about it when you're designing the system too, right? We wouldn't have designed our system. So we we have a system for doing what we do that requires two or three roles, like lots of them, lots of those people. Do you mind sharing an, exam- an example? Yeah, so an example would be the people who recruit experts for us. So you can think of Stream almost as a, a podcast network where you know we have 200 interviews a week, but essentially it's a buy-side analyst interviewing an industry expert you're not dissimilar from yeah. us. And right. And so how do you run a podcast network with that's doing two hundred interviews a Can week? Can I ask you something extremely stupid? Because I use your I use yeah. this product every single day of my life. Do yeah. you have an yeah. app that I could listen to these on? Yeah. So it's uh it's mobile friendly. Uh, so if you go if you go on what do you have? iPhone? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So do you use Safari? Yeah. Yeah, so just go to the website on Safari and you can listen to these like you would listen to a podcast. Oh, dude, that's what I should be doing when I'm like walking around and listening to like Joe Rogan. Yeah. I should be listening to these. Yeah, yeah. I sit down and I read them. <laughs> I, I turn them out and I read them. Uh, I think that that's the way everybody historically has done it. But I'm, right? an, audio, been... I'm an audio guy. Like I stuff sticks when I hear it. Me too. It's strange, right? Yeah. I listen to audiobooks. I'm I'm functionally illiterate which is kind of ironic for somebody who runs a transcript content business. But like, I, I, you know, I listen to audiobooks, I listen to podcasts. When I listen to these stream interviews, I pick things up and, and it's really interesting to me. And, and so, yeah, you can listen to them on one time, one X, two X, three X. Oh, speed. I'm so embarrassed that I haven't done that already, but. Oh yeah. I'm- no, well, this is, this is our fault. We haven't really publicized this and, and put it out enough. And we're also working on a mobile app, so it will be much more obvious. Yeah, I think that would future. be awesome. That would be a huge enhancement. Yeah. yeah, so that's one of the things that we get from this partnership with AlphaSense, this acquisition by AlphaSense, because they've got world-class technology, and and um, and that, these are the kind of things that we can be rolling out. You know what really you strike me as? Forward. You strike me as the kind of guy that wants to own a lot more of a watermelon than a whole grape. Which is like, like, I think you're, I, I, I like how, um, I, I like how you, you just strike me as somebody that like, I don't care where the credit goes. I don't care, you know, what I need to do to get there. I want to build the system. I want the system to work and it's going to be great. And it's going to get bigger over time. Is that fair? I think that's fair. I think, I think there's a lot of reasons for that and they're not like, it's not like I'm a great, <laughs> not just some great, like it's not a really great altruistic thing. I just think that that's um, over the past 10 years, probably a journey, an evolution where wanting, you want your teammates to be successful because if you can have a team of people doing something really well and they can enjoy it and they can all be bettering themselves and growing over time and it can create the business outcomes you're looking for. I mean, that's the juice right there, yeah. in my opinion. And so that's what I enjoy most. Like, how did you feel when AlphaSense approached you? Did you feel like you were letting go of your baby at all? Or were you like really amped to partner no, initially? I, I know way, you are now. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the way that I always thought about it is, listen, I'm a, I'm a pilot. I don't know. This is one, one, meta, one analogy, but you know, I'm a pilot. I have this plane and I can fly at only a certain distance. And then somebody else should take the controls and fly at you know, the next distance, right? Or it's like a, a race. I've got the baton and I can hand off the baton. Not like I'm going to step aside, but you know, I'm still working on it. But really, like what was best for this business is that there is a lot of resources going towards this. We've got product market fit. We've got a great system that scales. And, um, and so the more that I can hand that off and enable other people to run with it, the better. Yeah, th- that's what I mean. You're like a guy that wants to yeah. like let the watermelon become the watermelon, right? Rather than like be like, no, it's mine and I need to have it. I think it's really yeah. smart of you to be like, this is where it should go and it can be way bigger and way better if it goes there. Yeah, I think that's right. That's nice of you to say it that way. Yeah, it's uh, it's like a respect for the business itself rather than like an ego pursuit, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. Well, it's, I think also it, it, it's easier to, when you enjoy the craft, 
you know, like I just really enjoy like this first year or two of creating a business. It's fun for me. And, you know, there's, I don't know. It's just, it's one of the things that I enjoy doing. This isn't like the thing that I have tattooed on my arm that's going on my headstone when I die. Yeah. Well, that's so, cool. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, what is like, what was alpha senses, I guess, what can customers look forward to after they take over? Like, what were you excited about partnering with them for? Oh yeah. Well, I think strategically, it just makes a lot of sense when you have this much content and it's long form content. So I don't know for your listeners who aren't familiar with it, each of these interviews, we're doing a couple of hundred of these interviews a week and each of them are a transcript that's you know, five to 20 pages long, right? It's just really dense, long form content. Seems like none are shorter well. than 10 and 18 is like what I seem to get into often. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so it's a lot, yeah. right? And, and over time, I think you need to have some really great technology sitting on top of that in order to make the discovery of those insights really effective. So I think from a browse, you know, if you think about the different experiences, browse versus search, right? So when you come in to stream right now, we've put the minimal amount of effort and money into the technology experience because for us, it was all about content because we figured you know, if you have really good content and enough of it with just a, a technology experience that doesn't hurt the product yeah then then you're good right and so that's what we've done so far but now you take alpha sense which has spent the last 13 years building the world's best search experience for for business documents we get to layer that on top so you can start to look at these transcripts and see sentiment you can start to see kpis pulled out automatically ah that's pretty right? cool okay, so there's all kinds of cool stuff that you'll be able to see and then essentially data sets that you'll be able to create or that you'll be able to see coming from these qualitative documents. So there's that, um, which I think is really nice. So it's going to make the discovery in the search experience a lot better. I think there's a lot more that we can be doing in terms of understanding your preferences. So if you've read certain things, we can start to serve things up to you, kind of like a, a Netflix type of experience. Like, hey, we, hey, Bill, we thought you'd like these things, hmm. right? So the browse experience should improve the browsing experience. In addition to the searching experience. You know what would be kind of cool is if I could say, like, I like these patterns. I mean, this is all pie in the sky stuff. Right? Oh, yeah, like, yeah, I yeah. like this pattern recognition in what I'm looking for. And then if there's a transcript that comes by, you can say, like, hey, you may not know this industry, but this is a pattern that that we know you like. Oh, we should talk about it because it like you could almost create a filter based on that type of pattern. Yeah, it'd be right? super and interesting. You could get email alerts. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what's it's super fun because I think I... I don't understand what you do well enough to understand what the important patterns would be. But if you can explain them to us, that's something that we can then take and, and run with. Yeah, so I can. Really I mean, neat. we can definitely, I can get you a focus group or something pretty easy. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. So yeah, I think that just the overall experience and the ease with which you can find and discover things that are, that are valuable is going to improve significantly. And the amount of content is going to, increase significantly as well so that's one of the big efforts right now is just thinking about how to to increase the amount of content while maintaining or improving the quality of the content and then if you I, I, most people you know you might not have used alpha sense before but in alpha sense you have all the broker research right all the sell side research plus any of the company filings and announcements and transcripts plus any news now plus the stream information the on the ground perspective yeah. so you've got these four you've got these four key perspectives that are coming into one place with a lot of really strong technology on top of it so you know what if you wanted to see companies where the public sentiment let's say from the brokers and the company itself and the news was positive but there was a shift in sentiment amongst the on the ground transcripts, the on the ground interviews shifted from positive to negative recently. Yeah. Right. Maybe that's something that's interesting. You could see the variant perception there, let's say. So anyway, anytime you've got you know, those four key types of those four key types of information coming into one place, 
and it's easy to discover patterns and trends within them, then I think there's there's a lot of room for for some really fun stuff to be done there. Do you um as as somebody who's posting all of the well a lot of the transcripts like how do you search out sort of whether or not people know what they're doing when they're giving the interview or do you search that out and do you try to mitigate um, bias by coaching people up or anything like that like how does that work behind the scenes? Yeah, so we've we decided early on not to try to control the content of the interviews too much just kind of going on the thesis, like we do, we'll do what we do well, L- let the interviewers do what they do well. Yeah. And so I think what we've done a good job of is creating a system and an ecosystem that has multiple checkpoints in place to assure quality, uh, to ensure quality. So the analysts who are hosting these calls, it's not just any client who can pay us a couple hundred dollars to do calls. It's a very specific pool of clients and analysts that we've recruited and we've interviewed and we've screened them. We've made sure that they have a certain amount of experience doing these types of expert calls because there's a big difference between an analyst who has done 500 hours worth of expert calls and an analyst who's interning for the summer someplace. Yeah. And so we've screened them for, for things like that. And we've also then before we allow them to do calls on the platform, we have them do a few calls and we read them. We have a panel of, of clients oh, and other cool. analysts who read them and basically give them a driver's test to make sure that they are, um, they're good enough at hosting these calls generally in order to be on the platform. And then I think we do a really good job of, of matching topics to analysts in a way that results in the analysts who are hosting the calls generally knowing the topics really well and the incentive systems are aligned so that that's the, so that that's the case. So generally there shouldn't be a lot, there shouldn't be a lot of bad calls on the platform, but there's additional screening and ratings and things like that, that we, that we do to, to kind of scrape out anything or identify any problematic, problematic interviews. Have you ever from considered a voting standpoint? on the, uh, on the transcripts or anything? I think that would be great. Yeah. I and mean, right now we have thumbs up and thumbs down, but we're not doing enough to, to get it in people's faces. And I think generally it's tough to get this audience to, to vote on anything. Yeah. But, but yeah, I, it would be great. I don't, I don't know. Have... I don't know how much that would introduce bias or not. I'm, I'm just not sure, but it, it is a thought. I, I personally have found the quality of the transcripts to be quite good. There, there have been like maybe one, maybe one or two. And I've read a lot uh, where I've been like, eh, I don't know that this person had like industry knowledge to do it. It's kind of like base, but man, yeah. I'll tell you what I, 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 uh, when you guys said yes to partnering with me and sponsoring me, I was really, really proud that you said yes, because I hope that the quality of this podcast is of similar quality of the, the quality of your transcripts. Right. And I, I kind of oh, man. view us as similar brands in that way. So it was very cool, uh, of y'all to say yes. Well, I really appreciate you saying that. So yeah, we've got we've got those in place. If you ever notice anything that's on there that you don't think deserves to be on there, you let us know. And um, generally, if you can control the ho- the quality of the host, you can control the quality of the content because I mean, you know the buy side analysts. They there's a certain pride of ownership and a pride of craftsmanship. Yeah. Yeah, they're not going to just hop on these calls and wing it and, and throw something against the wall in most cases. They're taking their own time to get on the call and to try to get some really good information from it themselves. And they're paying. And so they're, I mean, it's, it's like yeah. real money that's coming out of their pocket. Yeah. So it's not something that, um, yeah, generally, generally the, the quality is pretty good. So I, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. Actually, uh, as part of the sponsorship, I'm going to do my best to read like insights from some of the transcripts that I've been reading. And the first yeah. episode that we did, I read, I sort of incorporated some of the insights from Coinbase because we mentioned oh, Coinbase cool. in the conversation. The analyst that did those calls reached out to me and he's like, I just yeah. want you to know that was me. And I was like, oh, cool. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. He actually heard it. Yeah. Yeah. And he put, he put it together. Yeah. He, that's you know, it's sort of your, your pride of ownership thing. I think, you know, there's, there is a bit of a competitive nature, I think, to giving the better interviews. 
which is good. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's something that can be done there as well. If you think about if I'm an analyst doing calls on a platform, if I can somehow make some of those, some of those, I don't know, if I can use that to help develop my personal brand yeah. or if I can use that to, to create an audience of some sort, there might be something there. If we brainstorm long enough, we're going to make you a creator, a creator economy platform that's ready for the metaverse. That's uh, that's, that's how we'll pitch you. <laughs> I think a lot of people would listen to a podcast that, <laughs> that, that had those, those keywords. That's so right. That's, that's what everybody's yeah. <laughs> saying these days. It might as well be you. Let's do it. Yeah. I like it. So, so what's, I mean, what do you, where do you see yourself in like 10 years, man? I know that's an impossible question to answer. I'm going to, I'm going to coach football. Yeah. So I've started, I've started coaching my son's football team. So he play tackle on the weekends. He plays flag right now, but he's itching to play tackle. And I played football growing up. So how do you and, feel about um, that? I'm okay with it. Yeah, I wouldn't want to restrict him from doing it. I see. That, I think that there's a lot of, you know, pluses and minuses. But generally, I think, as a backdrop, I think team sports are fantastic. I, I've hired a ton of people from team sports, and and I think that what you learn from playing team sports just far outweighs almost any other experience that people can have <laughs> growing up in terms of preparing them to be successful and just, you know, decent people in the workforce. And so I think that it's a great thing for him to play team sports. If he likes football, I think that there's enough precautions in place now that somebody can play tackle football and, and live to tell the tale in most cases. And, um, that's a lot different than when I was playing. So when I, you know, I played football in high school and college and. How did you play? I played at Penn. Really? For a couple years. Yeah. And I had a few really, really bad concussions my freshman year. Dude, that's year. big time. I didn't know that you were uh, like a real football player. This is terrifying. I can never make you upset. You'll kill me. You, you seem no, so like, nice and smiling. Uh, that's right. A, a, a pacifist uh, <laughs> over time. <laughs> they beat it out of you. Like upset, uh, upset enough people. What'd you play? What position? To... So I played fullback my freshman year and I played tight end my, my sophomore year. And then I quit because I had a bunch of concussions and, and they sl they slowed me down. Huh. They couldn't be as aggressive. And I was probably 40, 50 pounds heavier than, than I am now. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. So I think that just given the awareness people have around that now, I think that you know, I feel comfortable with my son playing and just being really sensitive to any of the head, head injuries and making sure that there was enough time off between games and things like that. But I love coaching. Them. Yeah. I got to tell you, Bill, it's like really, really fun. I've never coached anything before. And I've been, I've been managing people for 10 years now. And I get to take all this fun stuff I learned about motivating people and managing people and apply it to nine-year-olds. It's like the greatest thing That's ever. That's cool. Much, much more difficult than running a company. And um, <laughs> well, they're also insane. We're oh, they're crazy. <laughs> we're we're undefeated, Bill. Are you nice? We're seven and zero. Oh. We're seven and zero, oh, and we have the Super Bowl on Sunday. Oh, that's awesome. And are you nervous? Yeah. No, I feel great. Right, I, I mean, it's just such a such a good group and we're doing we put in the fundamental we we're doing the fundamentals we we're doing what it takes to win and i say i want them to get better and learn a lot i want them to have a really good time and i want them to win football games and they're, they're that's cool i like that time. and i want you know if if all of them can want to play football again next year or want you know continue on then i think we like that's the job yeah at this age yeah but i was thinking i was telling my wife yesterday i was like i really like coaching football i'm gonna in a few years i should just I'll, I'll go and be a coaching assistant for one of the nfl teams i'll work for free just work my way up i want to that'd do be it. dope so that's one thing yeah i'm gonna be a football coach and i'm gonna be a yoga teacher and i think i'm gonna write some books that's cool man that's where i'm gonna be in 10 years yeah where are you gonna be in 10 years you know i don't know hopefully actually hopefully doing this i really enjoy it you know, I, I enjoy teaching. I'm nervous because I think I need to learn a lot myself. Uh, so I really just kind of learn in public. 
but I really, I, I have looked my entire life for a way to give back. And I think I have found a piece of it in this podcast. And, yeah. you know, I think if, uh, you know, my youngest is four. So I figure in 10 years, he's probably not going to want to talk to me anyway. And I'll have none yeah, of them want right. to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I don't know. I want to put in the reps with them now because I think these years are really important. So I got a four, six, and seven-year-old. But then once that's kind of over, I, I actually wouldn't mind teaching golf. I played golf. I kind of want to like coach the golf team. I like that. And I like doing this and we'll see, man. I, I, um, it's been fun. I need to, oh, I, man. you know, in Florida, I need to, uh, I got to do more in, in the water and like, I don't know if it's swim. I got to get active again. I, I have let myself get a little too sedentary and that's upsetting because I got all this playground around me. We're it's sleepy here too, though. And that's, we like sleepy. We're kind of sleepy too. Yeah. Well, then this really might eye, work. Yeah. 8.30, 8.30 p.m. bedtime is my ideal. <laughs> we threw a chili cook-off and time. everybody was home by 9 o'clock. I was like, I was like, yes, it's going to start raging. And then everybody just went home. Uh, I can tell now, like, if I'm going to be friends with people, like, if they, if they make a 5.30 or 6 o'clock dinner reservation, they're probably going to be my friend. <laughs> if they make an 8.30 reservation, we're probably, it's probably not going to work. Yeah. Like, like it's not going to last. It's going to be a one-off. That's how uh, my household is. Mostly because of my wife. My wife, she's like in bed at 9.30. No, no later. Yeah. I, um, I get in bed. I lay there. My wife walks around in circles in the bedroom asking me questions. <laughs> <And> it usually <laughs> takes her, it takes her about 45 minutes of that to peter out and join me in bed. And then we watch, we watch a TV show. We go to bed. That's it. TV in the room. Yeah, we watch, you know, we don't have a TV, but we have, we just have the iPad mm-hmm. or, or the, um, our laptop yeah. in the, um, in bed. We've been watching Ted Lasso. Have you watched that? No, I hear it's fantastic. I've been to Ted Lasso themed get togethers. I got to watch Ted Lasso. Yeah. Yeah. It's solid. Any good show? Do you guys watch TV? Yeah. Any I mean, good shows? we're into succession. We've been watching that. My, you know, when I was at a Ted Lasso theme thing, my, you know, the sick mind was watching squid game which i wish i never started is it good i don't know man it's um i think that it's like it says something weird about humanity that it's as popular as it is but i also couldn't stop watching it so it says something about me that i that i'm that way yeah they're they're getting good in general at creating things that we can't not watch. That's right. And I think what's super interesting about it is like I I don't know what the number is, but I think maybe they spent like a maximum of thirty million dollars on that show, and then you know hundreds of millions of views or whatever, or hundred million views. I don't know what it is, but it's crazy. But I I don't know that I would tell you to start it. I would stay at Ted Lasso. It's a little bit soft. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, Squid Game, I think, makes you want to like uh, <laughs> cover yourself and wonder what's wrong with you. And Ted Lasso, everyone that watches it is like, it just makes me happy. So it's such a feel good show. It's actually legitimately funny too, like laugh out loud funny. This is fun. What else do we? What else? Do I don't we know, cover? man. Whatever talk, you want we can to talk all day. Well, I think we next time we talk, we should come prepared with a list of television show recommendations for. If if anybody else in your audience is like us and goes to bed at eight thirty and at night, I'll tell you what you should watch. I interviewed uh, the guy that the director of Class Action Park, I think is what it's called. It might be just oh. Action Park or whatever on HBO. Yeah. I I saw that one. I like that. You should listen to the interview. I, it's cool. I'll listen to the interview. Yeah, he's a nice guy. I grew up in Pennsylvania. Adventure Park. Not 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 far from Class Action Park. Yeah. Yeah. That place was insane. Yeah. <laughs> you and your football buddies would probably go and destroy people there if you ever went. But Oh, it's <laughs> totally. Yeah, absolutely. Day trip from Penn. Oh, that's funny. So you were you played okay, you played at at Penn as in like Wharton Penn? Like you, Penn? Yeah, Wharton Penn. There you go. That's the good Penn. Penn That's the good Penn. Yeah. Yeah. Not not at football. 
this year. But oh, I'm going back to a football game on, on Saturday, taking my son. And a few of my friends are like pretty heavily involved still. So we're going to go down on the field. Oh, wow. And he's going to get to see it. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, it's really fun. I mean, so are your seven, your four-year-old's a boy. They're all boys. six and seven-year-old? All boys. Yeah. <laughs> I might as well That's just cool. get them pads now. Yeah. I mean, they're going to, yeah, they're going to hurt themselves at your house if they don't have pads. So <laughs> the, um, my son is really, he's a good musician. Like that's his thing. Like ever since he was six months old, he's been like watching Rolling Stones videos and huh. like just really into it. He plays guitar really, really well for a nine year old, like really good. And he's, he loves good music. So he's learning, you know, he knows a bunch of um, Rolling Stone stuff and Led Zeppelin and um, Ozzy Osbourne, like, like pretty good stuff. And, um, I never thought he was going to play sports. So he had no interest in sports at all until like a year and a half ago. And now he's just all in huh. on football. He's playing football, soccer, basketball, like just loves it. That's awesome. Yeah. It's cool. The, uh, the football thing, I, I actually like for a second, I was on this. I'd never let him play. Now I'm on a kick where I actually want them to play because I don't think there's any better game to teach working together than football. And I don't know how yeah. messed up you can actually get as a kid these days. Like you're not taking the huge hits yet. There's so much awareness around it too. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think in any type of physical sport, there's a real, there's a, a chance of injury, right? Yeah. Like the catastrophic injury. But I feel like, the concussion stuff that we grew up with. I think that they're, they're doing, it seems like there's so much awareness around it that that should be, you know, not as big of a factor. The other, the thing he started playing is soccer. Do you ever get into soccer? Like, do you watch it? I don't. I, I got into me FIFA either. when I was a kid, but it was very hard for me to actually enjoy watching soccer. FIFA on like Nintendo. Uh, yeah. It was PlayStation, but yeah. 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 Me too. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. It was fantastic. I never played soccer. I played soccer for like, you know, when you're a kid and, and there's a time period where you're too young for anything and soccer is the only sport you can yeah. play. Like that's what I played soccer for like two years then. And then as soon as you could play other sports, I stopped playing soccer and never, never saw a soccer game until this year. And then my son started playing soccer and I've watched it. And that's actually a fun sport for kids. Hmm. If you asked me this a year ago, I would have said no, like there's no like that's not interesting at all. But that sport teaches teamwork. And like all the good stuff that you'd want and less violent. And it's really fun to watch too. Hmm. If the kids are decent, like in that like nine or 10 year old range, like it's good. So like, I've really, really enjoyed that. We've watched, I've watched a bunch of soccer every Saturday when he's playing. Do you guys get into hockey up there? <sighs> he hasn't just cause he never learned to skate. Yeah. And he's kind of like, he's kind of right on the, the trains leaving the station on that one. Yeah, well, they think. get kids so young. It's crazy. I know. Yeah. Like up in Chicago, got, they, were, they were hockey fiends, you know, and like my kid liked it, but I didn't have the heart to tell him, but I was just like, not that good at hockey, man. Like some of these kids can skate. Totally. Yeah, I never got into it. I never learned how to ice skate. Well, you know, I've hired a ton of hockey guys huh. and they're the easily, if I had to choose one sport to hire from, it would be hockey. Why? And then I heard, I heard, okay, so I heard separately from a friend of mine who's like a senior HR person at Goldman that they always, hockey's the most successful of all the people that they hire as well. Huh. And the thinking is that there's some, some natural filters that take place in hockey that don't take place in other sports. So, for example, you need to learn how to skate, which means you need to fall down 5,000 times and continue to get up, right? Mm. And you do that at a young age and there's probably some sort of like inherent, either you learn it, you learn stick to through that or you're pre-wired for stick to you know, like mm. to stick with things. Like, but just that process is one filter that other sports don't have. Another one is that your parents have to like kind of give a crap about you. Yeah. Because they have to take you, they have to take you places at like 5 a.m. To, to play, like, an hour and a half away at 5 a.m. for practice yeah right and so you most of the people come from like a good a good parental system where at least one of their parents like 
cares about them and is supportive. And I think there were a few other things, but there were, and maybe they're just looking for evidence to support the outcome, but generally they found that hockey was the most successful group of people they hired from out of all the sports in college. That's interesting. And I found the same, I found the same thing too. Like, and for me, it was, le- there's less ego and less like me first type of mentality than any other sports. Hmm. There's more camaraderie. There's also more um, like not taking themselves too seriously, but serious enough that, you know, from nine to five if it, or whenever it's heads down, they, they work their butts off, but they, they don't take themselves too seriously other than that. Hmm. So yeah. Hockey people. I would think fullbacks, not cause you played it, but that's a, that's a position that cares about blocking and doing its job. Uh, like fullbacks and linemen, I would think would be good fishing pools too, for that reason. Yeah, I've hired a few a few linemen, but I think yeah, virtual admins from the Philippines, <laughs> Ho- hockey play <laughs> hockey players from Canada, those are who you want. All right, there you I go. Think if you can, eighty percent of your staff can be those people. You're in good shape, no matter what your business is. Well, I'm gonna uh, follow up with you offline for real about trying to systematize what I got going on because it's getting a little bit out of control. Oh yeah, I mean you're the talent, Bill. You just want to sit down, sit down. Uh, you just come in, sit down, run it. <sighs> I care about how it much up. it costs, but it's getting to be a stupid thing to care about. I know. You know what will scare you though is if you think about what your time is worth. You know, like even if you think about this all the time, like you're, you're still willing to do things that you really shouldn't be doing, given how much your time is worth. You know, yeah. and even if you're like logically no these things, like I still catch myself doing it. Yeah. No, it's uh, well, like I said, it's it's gone from like something that was sort of fun to something that I'm actually pursuing pretty seriously. And if you're actually pursuing something seriously, you probably need some infrastructure around you. Let's go. I want to I want to help however I can. All right, cool. If, I, if there's anything I can do. Well, I hope that I, I hope that we helped you a little bit, but I hope that more more than helped you. I think I, I hope that people learned who you were and uh, are genuinely interested in your product because I I've fundamentally think it is integral to research processes and i uh i've now said it three times but i'll say it a fourth like thank you for for partnering with me oh man thank you yeah. and like before you knew we could be a sponsor before we could afford to be a sponsor you were using the product and saying nice things about it and so an really og stream that, user man. here absolutely like day three indeed one, like seriously i think you were really like one of the first you know, 15 or 20 paid subscribers is my guess. Yeah, it was early. early. Yeah. And I was a little nervous. I mean, frankly, I was like, I don't know how much is in this transcript, but over the last 12 months, this thing has been built out. It has been impressive to watch. Thanks. Yeah. I I mean it sincerely. So thank you for doing it. I got a lot of value out of it. Likewise. Let's do this again. Let's keep talking about the business stuff. And hey, like what you're doing isn't really that dissimilar from what we're doing operationally. So like, let's trade notes and and see if we can help each other out. All right, cool. I have a feeling that for uh, the beginning of this trading of notes, you may be helping me more than I'm helping you, but uh, I will do whatever I can to help you as well. I don't know. We'll see. (laughs) All right, man. Well, thanks for stopping by. All right. Thanks, Bill.